In this PowerPoint, we're going to talk about introduction to t-statistics. There's several different ways you can do a t-statistic. This is just the beginning part of running a t-statistic analysis. We will build on what we learn. In this PowerPoint, we'll do um, you know, single sample t, and then uh, next is independent t, and then repeated measures or related t. So some of the things we're going to talk about today are when we should use the t-statistic instead of a z-score. And how we're going to start off with that was the same way we're going to do the, the z, right? We're going to perform a hypothesis test, but this time we're going to use a t-statistic instead of a z-statistic. I'll teach you how to compute a Cohen's d to measure effect size. And then in addition to Cohen's d, there's a couple other ways you can find effect size too. And so I'll show you how to do um, r-squared or percentage of variance accounted for and to also measure the effect size. Okay. So some of the concepts to kind of keep in the back of your mind or um, refresh on is, you know, how to get that standard deviation for a sample, how to find the degrees of freedom, standard error, and those um, steps in hypothesis testing. Okay, so just really quick, just a review of the Z, right? If we want to be able to reject the null hypothesis, our obtained statistical value has to be larger than our critical value. And up until this point, we've been talking about z. So z obtained has to be larger than z crit. Or your obtained z statistical value needs to be larger than your critical value of z. This is going to be the exact same theory, but now we're replacing z with t. So instead of z obtained has to be larger than z crit, now t obtained has to be larger than t crit. Um, same premise for the p-value, though. The p-value needs to be less than the alpha. And again, the, um, the researcher is setting the alpha level. So if alpha set at 0.05, then that p-value needs to be less than 0.05. And um, p is the probability of the obtained statistic, or the probability of committing um, a type 2 error, or saying that nothing happened and it really did. Whereas an alpha is the researcher's acceptable probability of, you know, committing that type 2 error. Okay. So again, to be able to eject the null hypothesis, we take our z obtained, and we see where it falls. And as long as the z obtained falls beyond the critical boundary of, of the z, or the critical z crit, then you can reject the null hypothesis, right? So if our z obtained falls either in this shaded area, Right. for this shaded area, then you say that um, we can reject the null hypothesis. Now, in your z obtained, you only get one number for z obtained. You can get a negative number for z obtained or t obtained. Um, you can get a positive z or t or r or, or, or a nova, right, or for f. Um, you can't get both plus and minus. You can have plus and minus critical regions, but you only have one obtained statistic. Okay. So again, we're going to use sample data to evaluate hypothesis about a larger population. And again, that alpha level is the boundaries that separate the unlikely from the likely. Um, alpha levels converted to proportion um, sets that critical boundary, right? So, um, and again, if you have a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test, um, depends if you have to split that alpha or not. So if I have alpha set at 0 0.05 and it's a one-tailed test, I have my whole um, critical region is at 5%, or either to the right or the left. But if it's a two-tailed test, I have to split the alpha. So 0 0.05 becomes point, um, 0 0.025 right? on both sides. And the critical region is all the values that are unlikely to occur from chance alone. And any values that fall beyond the boundary defined by the alpha level is considered that critical region. Okay. So again, with z-statistic, we're trying to use that z-score to quantify inferences about a population. So z equals that um, obtained difference between whatever the mean is and the mu, and that standard difference or distance from the sample mean and the population mu. And we use the unit normal table right, to find the critical region. And um, we can use z if, as long as our um, sample size is larger than 30, or we know that it's, the sample is you know, pulled from approximately normally um, distributed population. But there's some problems with z-scores. Right? The z-score usually requires a lot more information than the researchers usually have available. 
right? Because it has, you have to know a lot about the population, standard deviation, the population mean, you have to know a lot about the population. And usually when you're doing research, um, people that are doing research only have access to, to sample data, right? So um, the t-statistic is the alternative to the z. Right? And just keep in mind that the sample mean should approximate the population mu. Right? And standard error describes how much difference is reasonable to expect between that sample mean and population mu. Right? Okay, but what if we don't have um, standard deviation? What if we don't know the population standard deviation? Okay, well then we would use, in place, we would use estimated standard error. Okay, and that's um, noted as an S with a sub M, right? So you're going to use sample variance, S squared, to estimate the population variance that, that, um, that look, looks like a little beautiful zero, right, with a curly Q at the top. Okay, and estimated standard error equals sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, or if you know only variance for um, your, your sample, um, estimated standard error can equal the square root of variance divided by the sample size. And again, estimated standard error is just used when an estimate of the real standard error, when the value of the population, um, standard deviation, mean, all that kind of stuff is unknown. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to provide an estimated difference because again, we don't have the entire population to work with. So here's your T equation, right? So t equals mean minus mu divided by this estimated standard error. Okay. And the t statistic is used to test hypotheses about an unknown population mean or mu, right? When the value of the standard deviation is unknown. The degrees of freedom. So at this point in this semester or in these PowerPoints, um, degrees of freedom is still n minus 1 or the number of scores or observations or people, right, minus one. So again, the degrees of freedom considers all variance of a sample score except the one, that sample mean, that's the one that's excluded, right? So n minus one score and a sample are independent and, and free to vary. Let's take a look at this. This is looking at the distribution of t-statistic. Um, watch what happens to the shape of the distribution when you increase that sample size, right? So, the, so again, degrees of freedom is the sample size minus one. If you only have six people in your study, so you have degrees of freedom equaling five, right? See how this T statistic um, distribution is kind of flatter, like someone is pushing down at the very, very top and like squishing it a little bit, right? And you see how um, tighter or more of a peak it gets as the um, sample size increases. So when we go from five to 20, see how it kind of tightens up in those um, tails get smaller or, or thinner, right? And um, the, the peak gets higher. And then when we go up to around 30, right? Anything over 30, it's going to approximate that normal distribution. So um, if you're wanting to get really good data or nervous about your sample size, just increase that sample size, right? By increasing the sample size, you increase the degrees of freedom. So T distribution is the family distributions one for each value of degrees of freedom. And it's going to try to approximate that shape of the normal distribution. It's flatter, the normal distribution. But again, the, um, and, and the tails are, are thicker at, at the ends, right? But the way you create it to make it look a, a little bit more like a normal distribution is just by increasing that sample size. Right? Now, we have a table for this also. Um, and again, the table can be found in the back of your textbook. Um, in your e-text, and I have some videos that show the um, how to use a t-table. So please, please, please look at those videos, um, and I'll show you how to find your t-crit, or your critical value of t, um, for your t-statistic. Okay, so um, we may or may not be using SPSS, but SPSS is the statistical package for social sciences. It's like Excel, but a lot bigger, better, <laughs> right? You can run some statistical analysis with Excel and they do great, um, but some of the trickier ones, the larger numbers, you're, running, you're going to want to use SPSS. This is what the output looks like, right? So whenever you run it through, this is what it's going to look like whenever it gives you the answer, right? So say we're testing an IQ hypothesis and we're going to set the alpha level at 0 0.05 
But in our null hypothesis, it's going to say something like, I don't know, this medicine will have an effect on our um, IQ. So an effect, right, is kind of a, a loose term. It could increase our IQ, it could decrease our IQ. So it's going to be a two-tail test. All right, so alpha 0.05, two-tail. You're going to find the degrees of freedom, right? And then once you know the degrees of freedom, so in our sample size, looks like we only have 10 people in this study, so our degrees of freedom is 9. Right, proportion of 0 0.05 and two tails. You should have found that the T crit or the critical value of T is 2.262. And again, I have a lot of videos on how to find, or a lot of examples in a video on how to find the T crit um, or the critical value of T. So for this one, um, the T crit is 2.62, and our T um, obtained is 1.847. Right, so we would um, fail to reject that null. So let's see here. So we found that 2.62 is the hypothesis um, significant. It is not. So we were um, we failed to reject um, the the null, right? Um, if you look down here, this is the significance level or the p-value. And again, the p-value um, must be less than the alpha. And we set our alpha at 0 0.05. Um, p is 0 0.09. So we definitely um, failed to reject the 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 null hypothesis. Okay. So the null hypothesis for a single, for one sample t-test, or one tail t-test, right? Sorry. Um, no, for a one sample t-test, but this is two-tailed, is null hypothesis is mean equals mu. Or that what you're saying is, yeah, you know, you can give them medicine, but their average score is still going to be um, kind of what the population is. Now, the alternative hypothesis would then be um, that mean does not equal mu. And again, for one sample t-test, two-tailed, meaning that um, the mean could be higher or the mean could be lower. Again, here's our four steps for our hypothesis testing. We're going to state the null and alternative, so you're going um, to create that pairing, right, the null and alternative hypothesis. Select an alpha level. Again, the researcher um, determines what they want to set at, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.001. Right? You're going to locate the critical region using that alpha level and the t-distribution. So find out you have 30 people in your study, well then the degrees of freedom is 29. And then so figure out what the alpha level is and then um, work on the degrees of freedom and find out your t-crit. You're going to calculate the test statistic. So in this case the t-test statistic for your t-obtained. And then make a decision. You know, do you want to reject that null or do you want to um, fail to reject the null? So do keep in mind that um, if you're having a two-tailed test, you're going to have two critical regions. So um, in the shaded part here, the t equals negative 2.306 or t equals positive 2.306, right? You have two um, critical boundaries as set by the alpha level, right? So in this one, our degrees of freedom equals 8. And um, so we're going to have plus or minus t equals um, uh, yeah, t crit equals plus or minus 2.306. Okay, so what do these kind of sound like, right? So some examples of a, of a one sample t-test or a single sample t is a researcher might want to test whether the average IQ score for a group of students differs from 100. Right? A cereal man manufacturer can take a, a box of a sample of boxes from the production line and check whether the mean weight of the samples differ from that 1.3 pounds at the 95% confidence level. Right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find out, does this group differ from the population? Okay. Again, um, your T equation looks a lot like your Z equation, except um, because we don't know a lot about the population and mu and population standard deviation, we have to use that estimated standard error. Right? So sample mean minus sample or population mu, right? their mean, um, divided by this estimated standard error. And how do you find estimated standard error? Well, estimated standard error equals standard deviation divided by square root of n. Or if you only have um, variance, then um, standard error would be, or estimated standard error would be the square root of variance divided by the sample size. And here's another example of what it might sound like. According to a national collegiate report, college students spend an average of 17 hours per week studying. However, you think that the students in your dorm study much more than that. You randomly select 16 students from your dorm and ask them how much time do they study each day. 
we'll assume they're all honest and accurate. Your results for the 16 students showed an average study time of 21 hours per week. For the sum of squares of 694, so what you would do is you would say, okay, well, I want to test this at 0 0.05. You would then look up um, degrees of freedom, um, you know, would be 15 because we asked 16 students. So alpha 0 0.05. Um, and, and you're trying to say that it's going to be a one-tailed test because um, studying more than that, right? One is a, or more is a directional word. And um, so you'd find your t-crit, you'd run your analysis, and then see if you could reject or fail to reject that, um, that hypothesis. Okay. And again, the hypothesis, how you go through that. State the hypothesis, locate the critical region, calculate the t-statistic, and then make a decision regarding that null hypothesis. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the, some of the assumptions of the t-test. Right. So the, the values in the sample need to be independent observations. And the population that the sample you're pulling your sample from must be normal, or at least assumed to be normally distributed. And with larger samples, this assumption can be violated without really affecting the validity of your hypothesis test. So again, if you're nervous about, oh, I don't know if my um, population is really normal, pump up the sample size, make it bigger. When is the t-test appropriate to use? Well, when you don't know a lot about um, population, right? So you don't know the population mean, you don't know the, the population standard deviation, that kind of stuff. And how does the shape of the t-distribution compare? It's flatter, the tails are thicker, right? But if you pump up the sample size, if you increase that sample size, it does start to approximate the z-distribution, the normal distribution. So how do we measure effect size? So just keep in mind again, or recall that effect size is the absolute magnitude of the treatment effect. How effective is that treatment? And hypothesis test um, determines whether the treatment effect is greater than just, say, by chance alone. Okay? And note measure the effect size is actually included in hypothesis testing. And also keep in mind that a really, really small treatment effect can be statistically significant. Right, so don't dismiss a study if they have a small um, effect size. Results from the hypothesis test should be accompanied by a measure of effect size. And you will see that measure of effect size in all APA um, statements you know, um, in, in discovery or results section. Okay. So um, estimated Cohen's D is that mean difference, mean minus mu, divided by sample standard deviation. Okay. And I know that um, we've done Cohen's D before, but this is looking just a little bit different just for our t-tests, right? Another way we can find effect size is percentage of variance accounted for or percentage of variance um, attributed to uh, that variable, right? So you're going to determine the amount of variability in scores as explained by the treatment effect as an alternative method for measuring effect size. So you can do Cohen's D or you can do percentage of variance accounted for. Okay, so how you find this is you take your t, your t obtained, right, and you square it. So say you run your statistical analysis, you find your estimated standard error, you throw it into your t statistic, and your t obtained is 2. All right, then you would go 2 squared, so 4. It's not your t crit, it's your t obtained. So t squared divided by t squared plus your degrees of freedom, and that's going to give you a number. If that number is around 0 0.01, it has a small effect size. If that number is around 0.09, then, then you can say, well, it's got about a medium effect size. If, after you square the t and you divide by t squared plus degrees of freedom, and that number is around 0.25, you would say it's got a large effect size. Okay. Now, again, these aren't thresholds, right? 0.010, um, so 0.10, basically. Um, would still be a medium effect size. 0 0.08 would also be a medium. So that's what I'm saying around. If it's around 0 0.09, you say medium. Okay, so let's do a sampling problem. So random samples obtained from a population with a mu of 70. A treatment's administered to 25 individuals in the sample. And then after the treatment, the sample mean is 79 with a standard deviation of 20. Was there a difference in the sample treatment mean from the population mean? And it's saying use alpha set at 0 0.05. Okay. So again, was there a difference in the sample treatment mean from the population mean? Okay, so 
um, our t equation is, is t obtained equals mean minus mu divided by this estimated standard error. Okay, so let's find estimated standard error first. Okay. So we need to find out the sample standard deviation and divide it by the square root of the sample size. Okay. So our standard deviation for our sample was 20, and we had 25 people in the study. So 20 divided by square root of 25, or 20 divided by 5, right, is 4. We then throw that estimated standard error in the denominator of our t statistic. Okay, so 4 is going to be on the bottom. And our mean for our sample right, was 79. Our population average was 70. So 79 minus 70 divided by 4, or 9 divided by 4, gives us a t obtained of 2.25. Okay. So let's find our, um, we'll do effect size. Right? Well, let's do um, t crit first. So again, get out your t table, and alpha is 0 0.05, two tail. Degrees of freedom then would be 24 because we had 25 people in our study. So our t crit is point or 2.064. Okay. So we reject the null, and I'm going to read this in English, or in a, the, like the spoken word, and then I want you to read it kind of mathematically as I go along, right? So we reject the null hypothesis as our t obtained with 25 people in the study gave us a test statistic of 2.25. We rejected the null hypothesis because our p was less than 0.05 alpha. Okay. So part of this class is teaching you how to be statistically literate. Right? You can be literate you know, with written words. You can also be literate um, computer, tech savvy, right? you can be computer literate. This is you becoming statistically literate, or being able to read on a higher level um, statements written in statistical language. Okay. So what about effect size? Let's do um, let's do Cohen's d first, and let's do the next one, percentage next. Okay. So if we take our mean, 79 minus our mu of 70, and divide by 20. Right. So 9 divided by 20, 0.45. So we'd say that's about a medium effect size. So let's do S or um, percentage of variance accounted for. So our t obtained is 2.25 squared divided by 2.25 squared plus the degrees of freedom because we had 25 in our study, so degrees of freedom is 24. So our percentage of variance accounted for is 0.17, or again, medium effect size. Okay. So again, this is a statistical sentence, and I want you to um, read along mathematically as I'm speaking in a language. Right. So um, we're going to reject and also um, our T, we ran a T test, and um, it had 25 people in the study, and our test statistic resulted in 2.25. We rejected the null hypothesis as our P significance value was less than the alpha set at 0 0.05, and it had a medium effect size of Cohen's D of 0.45, or on the second one. Um, if you read the second one, a uh, percentage of variance accounted for by, um, you know, you'd say, well, then it has a medium effect size again. Okay, so get out your um, t table again, and I'm going to give you some sample sizes and alpha levels. All right, I'm going to tell you if it's a one tail or two tail test. So um, push, still pause after you get out your t table and run through these, and then come back and check your answers. So hopefully you had time to check your answers. So with we have, um, let's see here, let's just give you the answers. So when we had uh, a degrees of freedom 11, alpha 0 0.01, two-tailed, our t-crit was 3.16 or 3.106. If we had 25 people, so degrees of freedom 24, in the next study we used alpha 0 0.05, but we kept it at a one-tail test. Look how much smaller our t-crit is, right? Um, 1.711. Um, if we had 65 people in our study, so degrees of freedom equals 64, we use alpha 0 0.05, but we had a two-tail test, so we just split the alpha at 0 0.025, our t-crit jumps up to 2.00. Okay, so when the sample size is small, less than 30, the t-distribution um, is what? Okay, so hopefully you got this one. It is, it's flatter, right? almost looks like someone's pushing on the top of the um, distribution. It's more spread out. The tails are going to be thicker. 
right? It's just going to be more flatter than the Z. Okay. Again, always, as always, complete your homework, text or email me with any questions, and we're off studying uh, T statistics. Again, like I mentioned, we're going to do um, independent T and repeated measures T. This is the beginning part of our T statistics.